concept of meditation is a concept that right now is very prevalent among people who aren't even into religion because they see the benefits of how much harmony it gives to your mind. So obviously we know that the Buddhists are the ones most prevalent and famous in using this technique in terms of meditation. It's a big practice within their religion. And many people who are not of any religion practice meditation because of the clarity and peace of mind it gives them. So there's a reality to this. And the Quran is saying, Tadabbur, 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 tadabbur. So there must be something to this. And we must learn, even Sheikh Bahjat, if you look, Sheikh Bahjat, before he reads Ziyarat Ashura, he says to get into the zone before you begin the ziyarah. How? You sit down and you begin to say the word Hussein. 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 With every breath. And you contemplate upon that word and slowly your heart softens. And slowly you reflect over Karbala. And slowly maybe you cry and then read Ziyarat Ashura. You know what that is? That's a mantra. That's a meditation. With every breath. What is meditation? So, just because I want to be very clear here. As in, the reason why some people think this is a taboo is because you're teaching things from other religions. It isn't. That whole introduction was to show you that we have a form of meditation within our religion. And this is a form Sheikh Bajat right now is giving an example of that meditation. I spent last summer in China. I spent it in a Buddhist monastery and I studied Buddhism in that summer. And there were many comparisons that I made in between Islam and Buddhism. And I was very surprised to how much that there was in common. And very interesting thing happened to me. Well, many interesting things happened to me when I was there. A lot of them when I engaged in talking with the Buddhists and learning from them and then learning from us, from our tradition, because I was the first Muslim that many of them ever met. I was the only Muslim in the entire city. And... For many of them, the first time they ever met one. So they were very interested in me and I was still practicing my own religion. I told them that I have to pray and I read Quran and this kind of thing and they respected that. But I engaged in meditation with them. What did the meditation consist of? They used to say that your mind is monkey mind because it's crazy. And the monkey is always jumping around. So, if you want to calm monkey down, you give monkey banana. (laughs) And the banana, what was the banana? They say to calm your mind down, you can never stop your mind from thinking. Because it goes crazy. Stop thinking, stop thinking. Then you're thinking about stopping thinking. So, in order to stop the mind from thinking, you give it a banana. What the banana is, is one thought. Just one thought. Give it one thought and leave it there. Don't give it any more. And control yourself to have that one thought. And over time, the fragments within your mind will align and you will be able to consistently contemplate upon one thought and then you become a person of complete clarity. Which is why if one has a problem and then they meditate, after, the, after they meditate, it's almost as if they have received some sort of wahi because now they have an answer to their problem. It's only because their mind is clear now. Many of us don't engage in this meditation. Salat is supposed to be this. Because what do we do in Salat? You think of one thing, right? That's what it's supposed to be. All our lives we're told, think only of Allah and ibadah and the words that you're saying. Don't think of the chicken you're going to get afterwards. Don't think of going to the gym. Don't think of going to school. Don't think of anything. Think of Salat. And so this is a practice that we have. We're supposed to be this way. What do you think atikaf is? What do you think spending three days in the mosque is away from everyone? It's not supposed to be this fun thing. Bring playstations or whatever else to the masjid and atikaf and we spend three days chilling, eating popcorn and everything. No. No, get some yogurt. Come into the masjid by yourself. Three days. Contemplate, read, think. Atikaf. That's what it's for. This is in our tradition, guys. Right? Neglected. So you're supposed to be people of thought, of reflection. By the way, very interesting. Just on a side note, my interactions with these people were amazing. Amazing. There was a one brother that I was with in the room. His name was Nick. He was a German guy. And he came to China as well, so we shared the room together. And Nick was a mathematician doing his PhD in mathematics. 
and he doesn't believe in anything outside the brain. And he tells me he doesn't believe in the immaterial world and nothing. And he came to China because he's looking for something. He wants to see, is this real, this whole immaterial thing? So this guy is really trying. Like He went all the way to China. And he told me, I never thought that I would come to China looking for Buddhism and I'd come up with Islam. Because I would pray in the morning. I used to wake up before everyone else to pray. And he said, you know when you pray, in, you know when you wake up in the morning and you sing? Sing loud. I like it when you sing. So I would start, Alhamdulillah, you And he would wake up. And so, me and him would sit down and a lot of other people, Wallah, the way we would talk, and they would ask about Islam. And I told them, we have someone called Hussein ibn Ali. And he was surrounded by 30,000. And he was with his family and he had no water to drink. And all he had to do was give in to a tyrant. But he stood by truth and power. And when they came to slaughter his family, you know what he did? Because all they kept talking to me about was, you know, Buddhism is compassion. Buddhism is compassion. Buddhism is compassion. I said, this man, Hussein Abu Ali, you know what he did? I said, he cried for them. And they were shocked. You guys have someone like that in Islam? This Islam that wants to cut people's heads off everywhere and Allahu Akbar and all this kind of thing? Yes. Hussein Ibn Ali was crying for his enemies, for what they're doing to their own souls and their hereafter. I said, but we differ from you in the end. Once it gets past the red line, we fight to the death. That's the difference. You might succumb on your knees. With us, we cry for the enemy because of what they're doing to their soul, but we still stand by truth. And even if he was one against 30,000, he took as many as he could out before he went. That was the difference. But they were mesmerized by a personality like that. You have something in your hands and in your heart that the world doesn't know about and you're crazy about, that you would die for. Do you know what it means to have something to die for? It means you can never be bought. It means you're too powerful for this world, for anyone or anything. And so this is prevalent in our tradition. There's so much more we can say. And if, the last thing, last point, just this one. Before I left, the brother Nick that I'm speaking about, he said, I don't know what it is that you have. We spent the whole summer together. I don't know what you have. I don't know if it's real. I don't know. But whatever it is that you have, I want it. And that meant more than anything. He spent the entire summer studying Buddhism. And all I did was just live by my own tradition in this place, by myself. And he said, whatever it is you have, I want it, real or not real, because I see how it makes you. We have this. We can go into a city by ourselves, the only Muslim person. If we have firm belief in this, then we can move mountains. And so in our tradition, there has to be this meditation, this contemplation. Alama Tabatabai would say there's no journey without this. He would sit at the end of each day and contemplate upon five things, at least, that made him remorseful that he regretted in that day and he would think of all the things that made him grateful and so he would do shukr a meditation of shukran lillah shukran lillah which is tasbih to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the things he was grateful for and he would do istighfar astaghfirullah astaghfirullah for the things he was remorseful for every day why? he would sit before his bed before he sleeps and do this because he's cleansing himself he's staying awake He's saying, many of us think we're awake. We're woke, we're woke. A lot of you are not woke. Because you can start the day awake and then you're asleep by 11 a.m. inside. You have to stay conscious if you're awake. And then suddenly something happens and you snap out of it and you think, oh my God, I've been asleep for two months. What have I been doing for two months? This whole time I thought I was awake and I was looking at people outside like, look at these people that are asleep. When you were the one in heedlessness, so you have to keep Contemplating, engaging in this muraqaba, that's what it's called. Muraqaba and muhasaba, to judge yourself and watch yourself and to stay alert. And to have those one dimensions of thought. When you have one way of thinking in terms of you think of one thing, so that our prayers are better. That's what our prayers are supposed to be. We're entering into the presence. When you come and you say, Allahu Akbar, you're entering into the presence of God. Let Salat be your meditation daily, five times. So you stay awake. Salat is what's supposed to keep you awake. If you're going to ask right now, Tayyib, okay, I get it. How do I stay alert and awake and conscious? Prayer. 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 The Adhan, 
is saying everything. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. It's saying everything that you need to know. And it's saying it five times a day. And you come towards it and you pray. And that's what it's supposed to be. If you're doing it mechanically, then it's no benefit to you. You're just getting rid of your wajib so that you're not punished. How much of a shame is that? that we have this opportunity to go towards something glorious. And we just, we, we, ha we take that we are not punished as enough. As enough for us. It's a shame. It's a real shame. You know when a friend of mine was teaching some children uh, how to pray. And the way he taught them was just amazing. He would bring them and make them act in a play. And he would say, all right, you're burglars and you are shopkeepers. And the burglars go into shopkeepers and he says, show me what happens. And the burglars get their hands up, do this. And then he say, freeze. And the shopkeepers do this. Right? And he says, wait, wait. What are you doing? He says, well, I'm putting my hands up. Why? He said, freeze. So why are you putting your hands up? Well, because like I'm submitting. Yeah. You know, when you come to Salah, you put your hands up, say, Allahu Akbar, you're submitting to God. As we say, Birfa al Ashra, right? I'm saying, Khalas, I don't have anything. Dunya is behind me. I submit. Allahu Akbar, done. Put my hands up. And that was just a really brilliant way to teach these kids how they're entering into the presence to show them that you don't just do this as a mechanical movement, that you're meditating right now. This is Islamic meditation. And we're using this word only because it's so popular. We know it as Salat, it's prayer. That's what it is. Prayer to give you clarity. Be a person of tadabbur and tafakkur. Contemplation, meditation, and prayer. This is what we're supposed to be like.